All right, welcome to Rangeland Principals class here at the University of Idaho. Again, this is Karen Launchbaugh. Today, I have the pleasure of having Dr. Ava Strand with me. Dr. Strand is a landscape ecologist here at the U of I. And in the last few decades, she's been turning her attention to climate because that is one of the things that affects the landscapes. So Dr. Strand, thank you for putting this information together. And, and will you tell us about changing climates on rangeland? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'll talk about changing climates on rangelands today. Uh, we'll focus on the rangelands of the Great Basin. So at the lower elevations and the more salty, saltier soils, we have the salt as a shrub. And as we move up and into less salty soils, we have the Wyoming Big Sage moving up the mountain. We get into mountain Big Sage and eventually uh, we'll have so much precipitation that this this landscape can support juniper woodlands and other shrubs. Yeah, and that's really familiar in this class. We've talked about oh, all okay. of these things within the Great Basin. So this all is right. familiar territory. And we know, yeah, we see the different soil types, mesic, frigid, cryic, temperatures uh, increase as you go right. And uh, then we go to the next slide. And just one thing about climate in this area, uh, this uh, graph shows how both precipitation and temperature are going from January through the year through December. And uh, temperature, cool winters, high temperatures in the summer, and higher precip in the winters and lower precip in the summer. So that's that's basically what we have in most of the Great Basin. Some areas have a little bit more of monsoons. If you go to the more eastern and southern part of the Great Basin, we have more summer rains, which might be more conducive to growth of grasses. Right, and we talked about the um, Great Basin desert or Great Basin climate, which is hot, dry summers yeah. and, and warm, uh, really relatively warm wet winters. Not warm quite as warm as the Mediterranean, but kind of same sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, they are. Uh, another characteristic of these uh, these shrublands in the Great Basin is the ver climate variability. This graph shows the precipitation in May for years from 1941 to 2009. And the only thing I really want to show here is how variable it is. Some springs have a lot of rain, some don't. And the vegetation here is adapted to uh, to that variability. Uh, sagebrush, like all other organisms, have limitations. They don't like it too wet or too dry or too hot or too cold. So uh, if it gets too wet, uh, sagebrush does, big sagebrush doesn't really like to have their feet wet, so they will, will leave. They don't grow on those soils. And uh, if it gets too hot or too cold, they might also uh, have water stress at too hot areas, for example, and may not be able to sustain in that climate. And the pictures you have here are just showing how much they can, they're very, how much variation they can have, large leaves, small leaves. Yeah, yeah. right. They can adapt to yeah. that so they can get longer. The climate water. Okay. Yeah, that sounds, yeah. That sounds yeah. Right. and mm -hmm. it can grow bigger if their climate is harsh, they can be smaller and grow slower. Uh, so over to climate. Uh, climate has been changing uh, forever as long as, as we have had an earth here. So millions of years ago, it, it was quite warm. And uh, we went through periods of warmer and colder. So it's been both warmer and colder in the, in the way past than it is now. And uh, currently, we're moving into a time period we, after the glaciation of about 10,000 years ago moving. Uh, we have had a pretty stable uh, temperature actually. And right now, what we're observing is an increase in average temperature across the Earth. And moving in more closely to the last couple of 100, 150 years, we can see this increase in temperature that's been observed, particularly since 1980. Uh, the mean average temperature on Earth has been increasing. Right, yeah, so everyone talked about the climate being variable, and, and like I right. said, sometimes it's been hotter and sometimes yeah. it's cold, but in the last 150 years, it seems kind of clear that we're on an upward trajectory. We are, and the rate of change that we're observing right now is also on. So the fact that it is warmer is not unusual, but the rate okay. is Got unusual. That. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is shown in this graph. Many of you might have seen the carbon increased carbon dioxide uh, concentration concentrations in the air that have been measured. So this is science that has been measuring this. 
Uh, and CO2 has increased about 31% since 1750, and we have the highest concentration than we have had any time since uh, 650,000 years ago. Uh, and, 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 and like I said before, the rate of increase is higher than it has been in the last 20,000 years. Your graphs also show that methane and nitrous oxide are increasing too. And, and right. methane we hear a lot about in rangelands because, of course, that is a result of ruminants. Yes. Um, but that's a result of a lot of other things there. So maybe at some point in this class, we'll talk about what contribution livestock do or do yeah. not make to methane. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. But I would assume this is mostly from burning fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels and, uh, and then loss of wetlands and things like yeah, that, they say. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. But all those greenhouse gases are, are increasing. increasing. Yeah. Uh, so, where are we with weather? What what have we been observing uh, with weather in the last hundred hundred or so years? Well, we see variability in the graph here to the left. We see that temperatures temperatures are getting hotter across the region, particularly over the last thirty years. So since about 1980. And in the graph to the right, we also see that there is an increase in temperature observed for most locations in uh, the Pacific Northwest. You don't see very many blue dots on that graph. They are mostly red of different sizes. Mm -hmm. It is. <clears throat> Another thing that has changed the, that will impact rangelands and other, all, everything actually, all growth of vegetation is the frost-free growing season uh, has become longer. So we can, I have even noticed, I can grow tomatoes now here very well in Moscow that I wasn't really able to do 25 years ago. So we see uh, a longer frost-free season. Right, and, we, and we've talked about frost-free growing season. We always think about climate as being a bad, climate variability, climate right. change being bad. But then having a longer growing season yeah. could be good if you're trying to grow tomatoes exactly. or rangelands. Or, or rangelands or grass, so, exactly. Yeah, so so there's, two, there's two sides to every story. There is two sides to every story. There are winners and losers always. <clears throat> and other change that's been observed is this intensified precipitation in the spring. So more, more rain or snow, mostly rain in the spring. Uh, another change is this shift from snow to rain. So actually the precipitation, the total precipitation hasn't really been observed to change very much, but more comes in the form of rain. And which of course it decreases the snowpack, the snowpack and has all kinds of impacts. And that's what this image is showing. It's showing the, the image to the left shows January, and the blue dots indicates increase in snowpack, red dots decrease. And when we look at the April image to the right, we really see this decrease in, in snowpack across a large portion of Idaho and, and uh, neighboring states. Yeah, and we hear a lot in the news about the concern over the snowpack. And um, just to bring it back down to the ground, that's because we need snowpack to create those that slow release moisture that is in that we use in irrigation. Yeah. So this is especially a, a concern for water sources and irrigation. If you don't have that snowpack, then it, you know, it it takes a long, it doesn't take very long for all the moisture to get out of the mountains. Right. So. Yeah. So so the summer you might have summer drought. Yeah. Right. And this is basically in other graphs showing about the same thing. The temperatures are increasing and we have more rain and less snow. Uh, this is an example from the Reynolds Creek watershed, which is an experimental watershed south of Boise, Idaho, that's been actually measuring all kinds of climate variables since 1960, so for quite a long time. And this graph here, the maps show uh, the snow, the proportion that's snow dominated, where the, the precipitation is dominated by snow on the graph on the map to the left was 54% in 1984. And then in 2010, it was only 4%. So that's an example where it's been measured that we see this reduction in snow and conversion to rain. And some consequences of this then is that the stream flow is greater in the winter and early spring 
but is greatly reduced in the summer and, and later in the season, which might induce uh, summer drought towards the end of the, of the year. And this is really good data because this Reynolds Creek uh, watershed, it's an ARS lab um, that's stationed out of Boise. And of course, this is down in the Oahis. But man, they, they know more about this watershed than just about anywhere in the Absolutely. West. Absolutely. Yes. This is really strong data that, and they, of how it's really affecting us right here in Idaho. Yeah. And they can show it. They have the data. Right. Interesting. Yep. Oh, big question. <laughs> what about the future? So how do we know anything about what we've talked about what's is happening, what's being observed right now, but, but how can this be extrapolated into the future or can it? Well, there are modelers that have done this, and I think uh, these models are really good because they are tested. So what they do with these models, they create a model and then they put in the past da uh, data from the past and run the model into the current time to see if the model actually predicts what's what we observe now and and these models have been shown to do that so the predictions then from these models this one shows prediction through uh 2000 i don't even know how to say that 2100 i guess yeah. and we see different scenarios and increases in temperature average temperature on earth of about four degrees are each of these lines, they're a different model, so it's a different yeah, scenario. Yeah, they're different yeah. scenarios yeah. depending yeah. on how much fossil fuel we burn, kind of business as usual versus if we increase. So anywhere from about a, a one to four centimeter or a centigrade increase degrees. Yes. It, yeah, well, pretty significant. Yeah, yeah, it could be. So then with these models, then you can uh, look at how might that impact plant growth. And of course, in the Great Basin and sagebrush ecosystems, we're very interested in the sagebrush itself. So this is work from Peter Adler in Utah that looked at four different models and tried to model out how the sagebrush would be, in, the sagebrush itself would be impacted by, uh, by the increased climate. So this is a prediction. I think it's, it's into mid-century. Okay. And the blue dots indicate that it's actually increased performance for the sagebrush, and the red dots increase, uh, indicate decreased performance. And, as, and, and then the middle ones, the ones that are kind of white and gray, are basically predicted to not have very much change. So in Idaho, we're talking about maybe not a lot of change or maybe yeah. even increase. And when you say increased performance, yeah. you mean like better growth and more cover? Better and growth, so, more cover, yeah. right. So. Except so, and yeah. Wyoming looks pretty good too. And uh, I guess it's there in Southern Nevada and, and Northern Arizona. Yeah, it's where we see some red dots. Yeah, yeah, that's where we start seeing red dots. But overall, uh, those four models that he looked at uh, are pretty hopeful for sagebrush. Mm -hmm. This is a model from another per person, Schlepper from 2012, uh, similar results. Just wanted to show you information from a couple of different researchers because it's it's interesting to, to see if they agree or if they don't. But they really do seem to agree. Same patterns, you see the gray is basically stable. The red areas decrease and the blue areas are actually an increase, potential increase in sagebrush growth and potential for growing sagebrush. Uh, so, so far we have talked about the direct effects, like what's going to happen if it gets warmer? What's going to happen when we get less snow? What's going to happen if we have more frost-free days? But there are also indirect effects. And one of those effects is other plants. For example, one that we're very familiar with in the Great Basin is the cheatgrass. Uh, and the cheatgrass may uh, increase even more even more in some areas. It might be able to wander up the mountainsides if it gets a little warmer up there and less, less snow. <laughs> it is awful to think. It, it really is. And we also may have insects and disease outbreaks that could be seen as indirect effects. And of course, the cheatgrass might lead to more frequent fires, uh, with, which could lead to things like lower plant, plant growth, lower animal and species diversity. A lower nutrient cycling, less biomass, and 
generally not beneficial to rangelands. You know, this is, we're talking about cheatgrass here, but one of the students in class pointed out that insects could be a real problem. Like um, they were talking about ticks, ticks on moose and elk right. as with increased temperature yeah. might, might really become a problem. So yeah. that's interesting, all these indirect effects. I know, I remember one year here in Moscow when we had a very warm winter and we had a big kid oh, eating yeah. the, on the moose on yeah, Moscow yeah. Mountain. Indirect effect. Yes. So. Uh, this is an example of how, uh, well, this is a beautiful picture of a sagebrush steppe, Wyoming big sagebrush and blue bunch wheatgrass ecological site. Probably very diverse with forbs and grasses and different kinds of birds and everything you would want out of the sagebrush steppe. Uh, uh, this is a, a post fire image. So this area burned. Fire is a natural disturbance in sagebrush, but you can see that the Fire didn't burn all the sagebrush. There are these little patterns of islands of sagebrush left. Uh, but if you have uh, yet another fire, you actually might lose even that sagebrush. And that's when, when the sagebrush step really gets into trouble, so to speak, and these indir indirect effects and, and we, fires might, might, might make it difficult for the sagebrush. Yeah, yeah, and we talked about how important those patches of sagebrush are because yeah. sagebrush dies back when it has fire, so it needs those seed sources. Yeah. And then as you get these more and more frequent fires, you start to lose even your perennial grasses. Exactly, so again, eventually. Yeah, so that, that cycle that we've talked about. Yes, mm -hmm. you have probably talked about before. So fire will be a key factor in the sagebrush ecosystems because uh, these barren lands that fires might, might leave behind if they are severe might lead to wind erosion, removing of nutrients, seed banks, etc. Uh, precipitation the year after the fire has been shown to be very important. So if you have a high precipitation the year after the fire, you might be more likely to have perennial grasses and otherwise low precip after the fire more likely to have annuals. Yeah, so if we switch some of that moisture to later in the season, uh, it could help. It could help some of the grasses yeah. reestablish. It's, yes. un it's unknown. It depends yeah. on a shift in that moisture. It yeah. does depend. It's important. <clears throat> so some uh, final words here, implications and adaptations. Uh, high elevation sites might actually see more productivity because of this uh, fertilizing effect that CO2 will have on vegetation. Perennial grasses might respond quicker after fire. Uh, on the other hand, low elevation sites might not uh, do so well. Uh, and uh, yeah, you might have some negative impacts there uh, with the warming. But where management really could do an impact is probably at the mid elevation sites. The high, high elevation sites will likely be fine without uh, very much input for management. The low elevation site might be very difficult to work with, but the mid elevation uh, researchers and, and managers think that management might really have, be able to have an impact. So some of the innovations that we have in restoration and managing yeah. fire, like with rural rangeland fire protection association mm -hmm. stuff, those might really be important in the mid, mid elevation yeah. to really help us keep what we have and, and restore. So yes. that, that's hopeful. It is. It helps you think about where to focus your energy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, seeding uh, has been done to try to re reestablish sagebrush after fires. Unfortunately, it often ha has not been greatly successful, quite uh, a bit of un lack of success there. Uh, but it's become apparent, and some of this work is from Matt Germino at the USGS in southern Idaho, has really looked into this fact of where does the seed source come from? Where do the seeds come, and how is that? seed adapted to the climate where it grows. And he's seen that it, it is important to match the climate of origin of that seed source to the place where it's planted, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we have learned a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and even just thinking ahead about what, mm -hmm. what will the climate be like when we plant the seeds. Yeah, yeah. And, and it could be seeds and it could be seedlings too. Mm -hmm. I think it's more common now also to plant seedlings, little plugs of sagebrush. Uh, some lessons that were learned after the 2015 soda fire is that seeds from warmer sites had higher success. Uh, weather after the seeding is very important. Cooler, wetter years gives better results for the seedings. And uh, it's, it, it's important to have better records of where the seeds come from when you plant them and to follow that. And this is also information from Germino.
Right, and so what you're saying here, seeds from warmer sites, that, that means when they brought seed in from a site that was warmer than where it was planted, it was really more adapted to that hotter, warmer conditions. It did a little right. better. So then the kind of take home point is it's really important for us to keep track of where seed came from mm -hmm. and where we're planting it. And, mm -hmm. You know, that's something we haven't really been paying a lot of attention to, but uh, maybe the soda fire is the first kind of poster child of really trying to keep track of that. Or yeah. at least it's maybe been done recently, but certainly they've done that in the soda fire. Yeah. So just have the seed collectors, maybe GPS, where they collect their yeah, data on right. the market have, on the map. Yeah, and, we and have better tools now. Put a label up in the seed storage and, and to know where it came from and match up that, uh, mm -hmm. the origins. Uh, I always like to show this picture. Should we talk about that? Yes, too? absolutely. Okay, you this bet. is a great uh, image from a paper that April Hewlett uh, published a few years back. It talks about perennial grass mortality. And what the graph shows on the x-axis, you have the, the fuels, and basically that's the shrub uh, cover or shrub biomass on that site. And if you have high shrub biomass, you can be expected to have higher grass mortality because it's going to burn hotter. It, it's pretty intuitive, I think. Right, but it's it's. A, but April it, pulled it out of the yeah, uh, the closet. It's not always uh, just you don't think of it right away. No. It's a really complex interaction. It just is. whether you have shrubs or not does affect the grass yeah. success or not. And April and her her colleagues did a good job of they pulling did. it out. And and the grasses under the shrub itself often have high, much yeah. higher mortality sure. than the grasses in the inner space because you see these rings around. Uh, after a fire where the sagebrush is sunk in. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And other thing that's important for impacting uh, grass mortality is the weather, so the relative humidity during that fire, which of course it's very difficult. I don't know any mm. any of us can, that can control the weather. So <laughs> I haven't tried. No. <laughs> and final final remarks is that of course, sagebrush step and all other ecosystems, it's composed of many different species. And if we take the pinion juniper example in this map, the predictions, uh, climate predictions tells us that the Utah juniper will kind of move more to the west, while the pinion juniper might move, or the pinion pine might move more to the east. So the pinion juniper ecosystem might actually split up. Yeah, that's bit. right. We always think of those as just yeah. being intermingled, sometimes more yeah. juniper, sometimes more pine, yeah. and maybe they'll, they'll, they'll go all different start ways. But you may also get new assembly. That's right. Well, it's a good example of what can yeah. happen. So. All right, well, that was a quick tour of how climate variation and climate change might happen, especially on rangelands in Idaho, of course. It's going to be different everywhere in the West. But Dr. Strand, thank you so much for being here today. Our kind of take home messages that we do know that at least in Idaho and the Great Basin area, we're going to probably face hotter temperatures, longer growing seasons, intensified spring precipitation, and then decreased snow patch or snowpack. And how that will affect sagebrush and cheatgrass and penny juniper woodlands are all still up in the air, but that's what we should expect. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.